Um, I wanted to introduce uh, a, a gentleman who's been involved in the IPv6 community for, for many years, uh, Dr. Chip Popovich, <laughs> Dr. Chip, as we call him, uh, is the CEO of NEFO6. Uh, been a long time uh, researcher and developer in IPv6 and cloud technologies. Uh, prior uh, to this role at NEFO6, uh, he was with Cisco for 13 years, uh, working on uh, strategies, architecture, uh, related to you know cloud and IPv6 adoption. Uh, he's an industry-recognized IPv6 leader, speaks at many conferences, uh, and you might recognize Chip's name uh, as being an author of two IPv6 books that are very key, uh, Deploying IPv6 Networks and Global IPv6 Strategies. Uh, if you're if you're here at the Beer and Gear, uh, there'll be a, few, a bunch of copies of his book uh, provided <laughs> uh, for those lucky people who can win those. Uh, so welcome uh, me and uh, welcoming uh, Chip uh, presenting Delivering Services from an IPv6 only OpenStack Cloud. <laughs> Thanks, Chip. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I know this is the last session, so it's me between you and the beer, and that's that's a challenge. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about um, an interesting experience. So our company, Nefo6, I'll talk to you a little bit about it, uh, not too much of a sales pitch. But um, we started this company in 2013, uh, 2011 uh, with that very specific purpose of exploiting the opportunities, what we believe were the opportunities of <clears throat> merging the two things together, cloud and IPv6. In fact, NEFO stands for cloud in Greek, and 6 is IPv6, right? And so we brought this idea to the market, to the industry back then, uh, 2010, roughly 2011. And we didn't get too much traction. First off, IPv6 is a little bit of an anchor by itself, as we all know, unfortunately. Uh, and then, you know, people were too, co too focused on cloud and figuring cloud at the time to look beyond cloud itself. And <clears throat> we finally, after all this time, got to the point on, one, being able to actually show these things work together, and two, which I believe is absolutely phenomenal, is the fact that finally the industry is getting to the point where they see this as absolutely critical to making things happen in this new vision that we have for IT infrastructure. What we typically say when we talk about these things is uh, make, have no illusions. All these buzzwords that you hear about, cloud and SDN and NFV and all, IoT and all this other cool stuff, nothing is going to happen without IPv6. None of them is going to reach their potential or their promised potential without IPv6. So I know IPv6 is not that cool, but without it and without people that develop things with IPv6 in mind, we are not going to go anywhere. And one of the lessons that we want to share with you as part of this presentation is that if we as an industry and as a community, we do not approach the key problems that we are trying to solve with an IPv6 mindset, we are set to fail. This presentation is put together and is going to be co-presented together with my friend, uh, our CTO, uh, Shishang, who's going to come here up to the stage in a little bit to show you a demo. I'll give you the hand-waving part. He's going to show you the cool stuff. All right, so um, just a little bit about us. We have, like I said, two areas of expertise, IPv6 and cloud. We have several customers, both on education, on consulting, and we have a product uh, which is called Sonar. You're gonna see a little bit of that in the demo, but this is, every, uh, Sonar very much uh, relates to measuring the quality of IPv6 enablement, measuring the quality of cloud services, and so on and so forth, by using these agents that are distributed around the infrastructure. So we'll, you'll see a little bit more about that as we go through. <clears throat> Our vision of the IT world. So the way we look at IT world is that everything is in flux now. There are a lot of changes happening. At the bottom layer is this transition to IPv6. 
It is all about scalability. How we scale all the lessons that we have learned while running IP and while making IP so successful, how we scale those to the new or next generation infrastructure that we envision. On top of that, now we have SDN and NFV squeezed in there because this is an older pyramid that I drew three years ago. SDN and NFV, it's all about flexibility. How, flex, how much flexibility can I introduce into my infrastructure? On top of this, we have cloud, which is all about agility. And then all this work is being done in order to make our applications go through their life cycle much faster. Take applications from development to delivery and back kill them and throw them out as fast as possible. Now, <clears throat> the one thing to keep in mind is that each one of these inflection points touches every aspect of the IT organization. It is complex in its own right, and they are interdependent. This is your perfect storm, because the timelines are very well aligned. We've been dragging these six, kicking and screaming, right, for what, 10, 15 years now? We, hit it, we are approaching the wall with it, we, we were convinced that cloud is the thing to do for the past five years or so, and now we are all convinced. SDN and NFV is even more accelerated, so it's going to get to this, the same point much quicker. And then we have, of course, all the mobility and all the IoT that happens on top. So the message, the takeaway, is we need to take our next generation IT our improvements in IT, we need to take them in a converged perspective, looking at all these things together. If we do them in silos, like we've done IT for so long, networking team, compute team, uh, storage team, app team, if we still keep on that model of, of dealing with, with things in silos, uh, again, we are not going to scale, we are not going to be successful. So, we pitched to the industry how important it is to look at cloud and IPv6 together. We finally, this year, we feel that the industry is on board. So, if you look at all the uh, large infrastructures that are being deployed around cloud, they all commit to OpenStack, and guess what? they all come to realize that they need IPv6 to scale. Deutsche Telekom with TerraStream, cloud, OpenStack, and IPv6. Comcast, OpenStack, and IPv6. AT&T, OpenStack, and IPv6. Uh, Cisco, OpenStack, and IPv6. The only problem is that the people who developed OpenStack, and we are all sort of guilty of not speaking up or not participating early enough, People who developed it, developed it with a very clear IPv4 mindset. So OpenStack today does not support IPv6. So imagine where we are, what we are facing right now. We have a clear need, a clear problem, and the solution is nowhere near where it's supposed to be. And this is a very good example of what it means to build things without a broad perspective. We, are, we built legacy from day one. Um, so we took that bull by the horn. And so we, in FO6, we were the ones that developed the patches to make OpenStack work in IPv6. So we first patched Grizzly release. Then we patched Havana. And now Icehouse. Uh, we also got OpenStack into production actually delivering services in dual stack mode and IPv6 only mode. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And the demo is going to show you that, yeah, it, it really is there and it works. Um, we, we are very open about this. So you can have access to our white papers on how we enabled on Grizzly and Havana. Uh, we work with several of the large organizations around the world who now are facing this problem. Uh, and I encourage you to, to get involved, to get, to get to participate. The more people 
get involved, the better the ideas are, the better solutions are. Um, we had an opportunity also now to, to get more involved on the OpenStack side. So we are not just the networking IPv6 guys that sometimes you can easily get perceived to be when you do something like v6. Um, so we, we had a fortune to work with Cisco and other large organizations on OpenStack and OpenStack plus IPv6. Now, this is a night chart. I don't expect you to read it, everything there. You can read it off of the presentation. It's in the white paper as well. And the key point here is going to be about me telling you what this is telling you. <laughs> so here is an example of what ha had to happen in order to enable OpenStack for IPv6. It was not just a very simple um, uh, you know, turn on features or turn on capabilities. The reality of it is that OpenStack, the folks that worked on OpenStack, they thought about it from a V4, purely V4 perspective. They were not aware of the provisioning tools and capabilities of IPv6. They were not aware of the way IPv6 works. And so we, need, we had to not only patch the system so that it facilitates the transport of V6 through it once V6 is enabled, but we also had to tell the system how to think V6. But we, told, we had to tell the system how to think V6 in the constraints, the shackles of the V4 architecture. And that's the big problem. It's not, we make it work. It's not a perfect solution. We need to do it better. But we had to work with the legacy that was already built. So what we had to do is we had to create some parameters, some additional parameters in, in OpenStack so that when we provision a VM through OpenStack, we are able to communicate who is going to be responsible of the provisioning part of that VM. Because with V6, you have multiple options. And then we had to communicate to that VM on how it itself should self-provision from that point on. So on one hand, infrastructure has to be informed how to do the job, and then the VM itself has to be informed how to do the job, right? So what you see here is basically the various scenarios in which we played with these two parameters and with the various RA bits in order to make this thing work, right, in various provisioning scenarios. What are the lessons that we have learned while doing this exercise? How many of you here participate or contribute to OpenStack? One? One, okay? That's a problem to begin with. Um, the, the reality of it is that in this type of open projects, it's very important to build consensus. It's also very important to get the leaders in the various projects to put their stamp of approval on your, uh, art, on your blueprints, on your code submissions, and so on and so forth. Now that becomes very challenging when those folks do not understand IPv6. And they take their sweet time to learn it, okay? So this is why it is very important for us to go beyond networking and beyond sort of our zones of comfort and get these communities to really not only buy into v6 but see the capabilities and the, the power of v6 because and this is not part of this presentation i in my typical cloud plus ipv6 presentations i do this but there are so many extra nice things that you can do with the v6 that you cannot do with v4 um, Typically, you hear a lot of people talking about, let's have IPv6 ready products. Wrong. We are way past that time. And this is another proof of that. We should not build IPv6 ready products. We should build IPv6 based products that can do v4 as well. And that is a major difference. Because this means that you from day one start to think of the problem in terms of IPv6 capabilities and, and, and functionality. And then you kind of try to, to, you know, to, to, to support things backwards. <clears throat> um, patching is not sustainable. 
Operationally, this cannot happen. And so we need to go past this idea that we're going to go back and fix things and try to put them back together somehow. They have to be IPv6 ready from uh, right out of the box. And then <clears throat> let's not forget about testing, right? All of us think about doing labs for v6 transition. All of us think, think about evaluations and so on and so forth. And this is another good example. The moment you start to throw scale, the moment you, you start to throw um, a state into this type of systems, the two protocols side by side start to interact and start to put pressure on the, on the environment. And so getting this process of evaluation and, and testing early is very important for us to start having something that is production ready, truly. Bottom line is, <clears throat> let's make sure that from now on, whether it's OpenStack, whether it's Open Daylight, whether it's you know, NFV controllers, whether it's IoT, whatever you want to call it, whatever is the next cool, awesome thing, let's make sure that that is done by people who understand V6, because sooner or later, it's going to come back and bite us if we didn't do it. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the exercise that we did in production. May 25th this year, European elections. People, all the countries in Europe uh, that are part of the European uh, Union, they elect representatives in the European Council. So, uh, and so basically, uh, you have one day elections, you know, voting, live results. So we work with this company in Germany. Uh, they host the live results of, of the elections. And they have an IPv4 infrastructure. Uh, European Commission has a project called Gen6, which basically is meant to help uh, educate state local agencies on how IPv6 can help them. And so they were involved and they funded this exercise. And basically what we did is we created an IPv6 only OpenStack environment that was sitting actually in Luxembourg. And then we had the V4 infrastructure in Germany. Now, if you're a user in Germany that has V6 access, one of the guys in those, those curves that Alain was showing earlier, if you had V6, you'd come to our infrastructure over OpenStack, uh, to OpenStack over to our infrastructure over IPv6. That's assuming that happy eyeballs allowed you to do that, right? And then, if you have IPv4 only access, then you'd go to the original infrastructure, okay? Um, we set this whole environment up. This is just a snapshot of the, of the interface, of the OpenStack interface for this deployment. We set this whole infrastructure up in Luxembourg. It was set up on Icehouse. Here you see some of the servers, the web servers that were set up on uh, OpenStack. You can see that they are V6 only, so V6 only addresses. Um, we're gonna see a little bit more of this, even though it's a dual stack in the demo. Um, what we also did in this, in this exercise is we, we used these sensors. You heard Michael talking about the distributed monitoring uh, concept. We used sensors that were deployed in OpenStack because we are able to instrument the OpenStack itself for monitoring purposes, and then throughout outside in the, uh, where the users are. And we use that in order to monitor V6 functionality, the quality of the V6 experience uh, versus the V4 experience. We also tested, one thing that I also wanted to mention, we tested this OpenStack infrastructure. I was mentioning earlier how important it is to test these, these new deployments. We tested, also using our product V6 Sonar, we tested the scale of the deployment. Uh, we have this capability where you can dynamically create thousands of, uh, of users, simulate thousands of users in cloud providers. And so we use that, and those guys sort of loaded over V6 our OpenStack infrastructure. What we also did is we helped these guys to integrate some of their existing monitors they use Munin monitors. I'm not sure how many of you guys knew about, know about Munin. It's open source. But
but that's collecting things like, like, like CPU and memory and I.O. and so on and so forth. We integrated that with our user experience perspective. And so in one dashboard, they were able to see for their OpenStack, IPv6 OpenStack infrastructure, they were able to see how the compute behaves, how the storage behaves, what the users are seeing. And this way, correlate the service from an end-to-end -end perspective. The results, 5% of the overall traffic that accessed the, the live results for the elections were, uh, uh, so 5% of the traffic was over IPv6. There is absolutely no problem either on the V4 side or on the V6 side. The user experience over V6 versus V4 was on par, if not better, over V6. Uh, we, with our agents, we are also able to see paths, right? So, so how you get over V6 to one point versus V4. And in fact, in Germany, V6 was more optimal, if you would, than V4. And then we just have a, a quote, you know, this is from Latif, IPC Forum president, but, but also, you know, the, 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 the folks in Germany were very happy and, and so on. Uh, bottom line being that we can do these things. They are not that scary, right? It is unfortunate that we had to patch things in order to make things happen, but we can do them. And they work, and they, 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 they can prove to have a lot of value. Now, what we need to make sure is that going forward, we have less and less patching to do. So now I'm going to hand it over to Shishang, who's going to switch over to his uh, laptop for the demo. Um, while he comes up, I'm just going to show you what he's going to show you. Uh, this is going to be an OpenStack setup. It's going to be dual stack, both v4 and v6. And we have instrumentation from the OpenStack setup all the way to what we simulate to be the user. So it's going to go through a switch, which is the Arista switch in the data center. It's going to go through a Cisco router, which, which will simulate the backbone. And it's going to go through a gateway, home gateway, if you would, which in this case is an open source device called PFSense, and then all the way to a home user. And can, can you? Are you are, OK, good. Welcome to. Are you still in the? I'm still scared. So while Shizhong is fixing this, you good? Or do you want to use, you want to use this one? Um, <clears throat> so while Shizhong is taking care of it, uh, by the way, this is our agent that was deployed uh, in, the, in this infrastructure for monitoring. It's an embedded platform. Uh, it's very easy to deploy. That's both Wi-Fi and wired connections as well. Okay. Great. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, some uh, technical issues. Um, before I start, I want to uh, ask a question to the audience. Uh, how many times you guys run into the issues that uh, when some user coming and complain about application issues? Uh, the application team blamed the server team, and server team blamed the network team, and just plays this uh, finger pointing game all day long. And yeah, we already saw some uh, reaction from the from the audience. I believe I'm not uh, the only one, and a lot of our potential customers or even existing customers has the same issues uh, in their you know, previous uh, experience. So. Here, um, I want to uh, spend a couple of minutes give you a high-level interview, a high-level view of our Sona product. Uh, there's so many monitoring solutions out there in the market, um, but 
our sonar solution fall into one of the category called application monitoring because we do not really want to go look at your CPU utilizations, your memory, your hard disk, or your uh, net IOs. The reason being is because we believe by the end of the day, the most important thing for you as an application owner or the business owner is the user experience. So with that concept in our mind, uh, we spent almost a, a, a year and a half to uh, build this Sonar solution, uh, which I'm going to show you to, uh, to you guys today. And surely we are not going to boil the whole ocean with a limited amount of time. Uh, instead, I want to keep our discussion um, very strictly uh, restricted in this context of, dem uh, of this demo. So here on the screen, uh, you can see this slides. We pick a, a very simple use case. Assuming you are the, the, the end user sitting uh, in your, at, at your home, you have a Ubuntu Linux computer, and you try to go to one of the web servers and try to consume some uh, web services. And from our perspective, we believe between these two ends, uh, which is your computer and that web server hosted in the cloud, uh, this entire end-to-end -end can be simplified into a three segments. The first segment is, as you can see, the OpenStack. We use OpenStack as the cloud operating, operating system to manage the compute, storage, and the network resource in your cloud. And then we use the uh, RISTA switch to uh, simulate our data center switch Sorry about that. We use a RISTA switch to uh, simulate uh, the data center switch. That form our, our cloud uh, segment. And in the middle, you can see we have a Cisco CSR router. Uh, it's just like uh, the, the regular routing switching network you can see uh, in, in other scenario. And then we have the last segment called Access. Here you can see a PFSense, which is the open source software, you can use it as your home gateway or security uh, devices, and then surely your, your computer. So along this entire path, from the user device all the way to the hosted web server in the cloud, we have our agent running on, on every single hub. Our agent is a Java-based application. It, the size is a three MP3 sounds, it's very small, consume a very little energy and resources on your host, uh, hosted device. And uh, by the way, uh, our agent can run on, on all three major operating systems, including Windows, uh, Mac, and also uh, Linux. Uh, we can also build our agent and make it run inside the PFSense. And we also can drop our agent in the container and, in, and inside the Cisco CSR device, inside the Cisco uh, ASR device, and also Cisco Nexus switch pro product families. And for the Arista, uh, we can run our agent as, as part of the Linux, Linux shell uh, as a native application. So all of these agents, they do one thing. They act as a, 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 a HTTP client. They go to the same web server and try to fetch the, the HTML file. And afterwards, they collect the user experience data and report it to our controller in uh, running in Amazon. Here, the definition of user experience is, is latency. In other words, from the user pers perspective, from the time you launch your web browser and point into the, the web server, how long is it going to take you to load the entire web page? Not only the index.html file, but also those embedded resources. So with this demo, uh, demo setup, uh, let's take a look at our, our system. Uh, does anybody use OpenStack before? Anybody familiar with uh, OpenStack, ISO House release? Okay, great. All right. Okay. 
So as the chief just mentioned, uh, Open ha uh, OpenStack as house as of today, uh, it does not support IPv6 out of the box. So what we did previously is uh, we patched uh, OpenStack and make it talk IPv6. Here on the screen, what you see here is uh, just a typical OpenStack login page. Um, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into the OpenStack as one of the user. And right afterwards, you can use this dashboard to do a lot of amazing things, right? including create a virtual machine. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see this panel. Uh, when I click instance, you can see you're going to see uh, a page with a whole bunch of existing VMs. Uh, here, as you can see, each virtual machine not only get IPv4 address, but it also get uh, IPv6 address. So in other words, it's is dual stacked. In order to create a virtual machine, um, I would just follow the standard procedure, uh, use this tool, as you can see on the screen, to give uh, the, vi the name of the virtual machine, and then I would choose one of, one of the flavor which would define the, the characteristic of the VM, including how many CPUs, how many memory, hard disk, um, and then I will tell OpenStack which image this VM is, is gonna boot from. So now you can see I give the v VM a name, Web Cluster 2, and I chose uh, one of the flavor, uh, which is going to give a VM one virtual CPU, three gig of a hard disk, and uh, one gig of memory. And afterwards, I come to different uh, tab and say, oh, by the way, I want this VM to attach to, to this network. This network, I already predefined it, it has both IPv4 and uh, IPv6 subnet associated with this, with this uh, network. And afterwards, there's a click launch. Um, it's going to take about uh, four or five minutes for this uh, VM up and running and uh, become a service uh, available. As you can see on the screen, this VM is currently spawning. So in the meanwhile, let's Look at uh, the Sonar, the Sonar uh, website, uh, which will give you a lot of valuable information. So this is a login page of our Sonar product. Uh, it's very simple, very straightforward. Uh, this is uh, the entry point to our Sonar, Sonar uh, web page. Because we believe in two main concepts. Uh, it doesn't matter how fancy of the technology is. Uh, NF, uh, NF, uh, you know, SDN, if by the, end of, and by the end of the day, if that technology does not allow the user to quickly enable the service, the value to our customer is zero. So that is the first uh, key, key concept behind uh, the Sonar product. Another one is, for all of those running services, we, we also want the business owner or application owner to deliver the best user experience to the consumers. So with these two key concepts in our mind, as you can tell, we put a service at the top of this, this dashboard. In other words, user can come to our dashboard and use this drop-down menu to select what the interest the service they're going to take a look. Here, we already have a couple of predefined uh, services, including the service trying to monitor our own Netflix 6 homepage. And uh, I think you may already, uh, you may remember, I, I use OpenStack to create a VM called Web-Cluster2. If you come down to this drop-down menu, that Web-Cluster-2 already have a mapping 
monitoring services defined in, 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 our, in our system. In other words, this is one thing we did on, on OpenStack. We patched OpenStack. Every time when there's a new virtual machine got spin up, we automatically update the DNS entry, including both A records and the quad A records for IPv6. And then we also make API call to our controller. So our controller immediately acknowledge and insert a new monitoring service in our system. Another thing you can see on this dashboard is we have a, a beautiful map showing here in the middle. Uh, on this map, you can see there's a couple of circles with a, a, with a flag sitting on top. This is our system agent. We have a sonar agent deployed across the whole globe, including North America, including Europe, and including Asia. So as a, as a business owner or application owner, you can use our system agent to see and measure the user experience from all of the corner of the rest of the world. And the, the flag is another interesting thing. Uh, they have uh, three different colors, green, yellow, and the red. In this case, you can see the flag show up as a red color. What that really means is IPv6 performance is worse than the IPv4. So that will give you some ideas of uh, if in case you have a do stack enabled for web services between IPv4 and IPv6, which one has the better performance? This, this is an, another page which deserves uh, our attention. Uh, remember our agent is going, to, is going to collect and report the data to our controller. Here we build this monitoring page serve as a visual aid for our customer to see, to see those data, to see those raw data. Uh, this diagram, you are gonna see this diagram for every single monitoring services, and they are going to update in, in real time. One thing I think is worth mentioning is, if you move the mouse on top of the data points, it's gonna show you, it's gonna show you uh, which agent collect and report the data at which timestamp and what the value of the, the user experience. Another thing you may already notice, uh, we have this red panel, and this is a list of, uh, of agents, including both the system agent already mentioned previously, together with the user agent, which you, already, you, can, come out, you can come to our two, create as many as user agent, and those agent is going to dedicate to you. For example, in the demo setup, uh, you, you might still remember we have the PFSense, we have the Cisco CSR, we have a, a Rista, and you can see the corresponding agent here in, on the right-hand side. One thing uh, I would love to show you you guys, and also uh, our customer found uh, really helpful and valuable is this uh, HTTP waterfall two. So one of our customer uh, jumped onto the call with us one day, and he said, uh, I, "I purchased a, a very big fat pipe for my home, uh, and I believe, based on the, based on the downstream bandwidth, my internet connection should be very fast." However, every time when I launch my web browser and try to reach some a website, I always see that spinning circle in the middle. So in other words, my user experience is really poor, regardless how fast my downstream bandwidth is. And I feel pretty puzzled for quite a long time, and, and he cannot uh, explain why. And just out of curiosity, he downloaded our agent and installed run on, at his home server, and log back in, to, our, to his account and uses HTTP waterfall too. He immediately got the, the, the reason. It's because the DNS lookup time took him five seconds. That's why he always see that spinning circle on the web browser. So what you see here on this page is 
Remember at a time when you as a user, you try to go to the web server and consume the web, web page, you need to do a couple of things, which a lot of, most of our users may not even aware. First, you have to do DNS, DNS lookup, and then you have to do, try to uh, establish the TCP connection, think, act, sync. And then in the last step, you are going to try to fetch that HTTP page so your web browser can display it. So by using this, this tool, we not only give you the breakdown list of this, the latency introduced by this three step, as you, may, you might already saw on this page, is, is we, we color code it. Um, so for example, here you see this a little yellow color that is latency caused by TCP connection. And this bigger purple color bar that represents the latency caused by the HTTP GET. And in this particular, particular case, the DNS lookup time is very small. Another cool thing about this page is at the top, you might already notice, currently I select IPv4 only, but we also have an, a, a different mode. If you choose both, then we're gonna put both the IPv4 latency and IPv6 latency side by side, so as a user, you can compare, right? You can compare and tell which one has the better performance. And if you pay a close attention, look at the top, our system can tell you. For the netflix.com, our homepage, supposedly it should be dual stacked. However, our webpage tell you, unfortunately today, you can still resolve the, the quad A records of netflix.com, but when you try to uh, establish the TCP connection towards our homepage, it's time out. So that's a clear indication something goes wrong with our internet service provider. And I think uh, let's, it's time to, for us to check the, the virtual machine uh, I just uh, uh, spin up in the, in the OpenStack cloud. Look, our VM already got uh, both IPv4 address and IPv6 address assigned automatically by the OpenStack. If you log into the console, uh, you can clearly see this host, this virtual machine already got a DNS name from the OpenStack. What it really means is now our server is ready, it is functional, uh, and uh, let's check our monitoring page to see what our monitoring page will tell us. As I just mentioned, uh, as soon as you stand the virtual machine um, in your cloud by using OpenStack, our uh, sonar controller is going to automatically insert a monitoring service. So as a user, you do not need to take any extra step to create a monitoring services for that particular web server. Ah, this is uh, what I'm gonna show you. Uh, clearly you can tell our agent already start working, even without uh, your awareness. At the beginning, you can see a big spike. That is, that is the time uh, VM is still kind of uh, you know, working very hard, all of, the, all of the resources is uh, cranking up, but after this, give it a couple of minutes when it settles, when it settles down, and then all of those four user agent belong to my demo account, will start collecting and report the user experience data and present it over here. And the one thing I want to point out um, at this moment is you may You may notice this already. For all of those agents, they come out to this diagram with different color. For example, um, in this case, the user agent data, raw data, will be, will be color coded as blue. And there's a two line of blue, right? One is a little bit thicker, another one is thinner. This is 
This, repre this represents the user experience, one for IPv4 based transportation, another one is based on IPv6 based of transportation. In other words, we put both of this protocol on the same diagram, so as a user, you can do the comparison very easily. There's only one exception with that yellow color. Um, we intentionally turn off the IPv6, so you can see that for those nodes which is not IPv6 capable, you only see the IPv4 user experience. Is there any questions? Sorry, I can I can not hear you. Um, how do you coordinate time stamping between all the agents and making sure that all of them have the same time reference so the logs are, you know, accurate? V very good question. Very good question. Uh, we have a, one of the components running on, on, on the controller side uh, is actually a scheduler. Um, I think you probably can already imagine this. The scheduler's main responsibility is when, when we have the new services, it's going to tell all of those agents involved in the monitoring and to schedule the, the monitoring event. So the controller will rely on the scheduler to send instrumentation to the, to the agent. Uh, usually they're probably apart by a millisecond level, so those agents can kick off the, the, the monitoring task. And uh, so far our agent will follow the same interval and go there, shoot up the monitoring uh, traffic and report the data to our controller. So from the pace per perspective, they are uh, pre precisely aligned. Any other questions regarding our Sonar product or our OpenStack? Well, yep. Um, you were mentioning that the, you guys had a patch uh, OpenStack with IPv6. Has that been recommitted back into OpenStack? Yes. Okay. okay. Very good question. Uh, as long, long story short, um, we did a lot of approval concept, like Chief mentioned, back in Grizzly. Uh, that happens around uh, July last year, and uh, when uh, Havana was out around October, we patched again. And afterwards, um, in the community, in, in the OpenStack community, there is uh, efforts going on around end of last year. So under the Neutron project, which is responsible for network uh, functionalities, there is an IPv6 subteam was created. We have a lot of uh, key players from uh, Comcast, from IBM, uh, and also include us, right? Uh, and also Cisco. We work very closely with each other to uh, do the couple of things. First one is propose the IPv6 related attributes, as Chip just mentioned. We introduced the two attributes in, into the OpenStack Neutron project. We also uh, work together to build a foundation for the architecture. And surely, as of today, um, not everything has been fully baked yet, but based on the archi architecture uh, we proposed, and surely already accepted by the, the Neutron uh, project, we believe we can cover pretty much all of those use cases for our customer if they're interested in, in the IPv6. And as of today, uh, that effort is still going, and uh, you guys already know, it's not uh, overnight, it's not gonna happen overnight, uh, we, we need to do a lot of education, uh, tell everybody IPv6 behave in quite a different way with IPv4, and surely we have to continue write Python code, commit it back to the mainstream, and hopefully we can help our customer resolve a, a more, e more issues. All right, um, that concludes my, my demo. Uh, we also have a table here um, next to entrance. If you have any further questions or you're interested in our product, uh, please stop at our table and we're more than happy to uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much. So a few, 
so a few more points. Uh, also, feel free to come and talk to us about open, OpenStack. So we'd love to, to tell you about, again, the enablement portion, what it, what it means, what it does. Uh, we, we are a firm believer in integration, and that's why, as you could see here, what we wanted to show is how you can actually add value, right? So once you have a, a platform, the monitoring tool, right, uh, or some other type of platform, but once you have that and you, you tie it in with OpenStack, right, you can all of a sudden have all kinds of interesting new optimizations, where in this case, you improve the DevOps, right? You take a service that you simply pop up on OpenStack, and with these APIs, all of a sudden, monitoring comes with it. And you, as a manager of the service, you don't have to worry about going and setting up some other tool that is going to start doing the monitoring. Your monitoring tool is already taking care of that, right? And so um, the, the, the last point that I wanted to make, and unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to make it before Shishong disconnected. Well, I wanted to highlight again how important it is for all of us to think about measurement and instrumentation. Because as you could might have noticed in the measurements, you started to see, you saw that first spike in the data, which was as VM was coming up, eating up resources or consuming resources was kind of slow. Then it flatlined a little bit. And then you see, you might have seen this, the second peak. Now you saw there were four agents. It was the one that was right next to OpenStack. There was another one on the, on the core. There was another one on access and there was another one on user. The fact that all four lines spiked, what did that tell us? That tell us that there was a, pro a problem on the OpenStack side, or on the OpenStack infrastructure, not on the network side, okay? So this is important to look at these things on the dual stack deployments, on the dual stack perspective. Why? Because I'm not sure of how many of you guys kind of monitor what the community, the V6 community talks about but you, you see more and more stories out there of people that come out and write a nice, pretty blog that poo-poos on V6 because they had this big problem and the only thing that they think happened recently was the enablement of V6. We should, of course, gloss over that they had a horrible layer to design, a horrible routing setup, but of course, V6 was the problem. And so information will help all of us, data will help all of us kind of avoid this type of situations where people will come point fingers to you, the V6 guy, oh, the problems they were having is because of your V6 enablement. You need to have the data that will say, no, 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 wait a minute. Let's, uh, let's see exactly what's happening here and is not V6 by default the issue. With that, Enjoy the beer. <laughs>